I'm Stephen Pemberton. Uh, uh, so uh, since uh, Boris told you all about himself, I thought I'd just tell you a little about, bit about myself uh, and, and why I'm here. So uh, 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 I originally co-designed the programming language that Python is based on. Uh, that was in the early 80s. Um, and uh, at the work, at the place where I work, which is the CWI in Amsterdam, the Centrum for Viscount Informatica, uh, we're the people who built the internet in Europe, in fact, uh, which meant that uh, we were the very first internet connection in, in Europe uh, at a full 64 kilobits per second, uh, connecting the whole of Europe to the whole of the United States. Um, uh, and that meant that I was the fifth person uh, on, uh, on the internet in Europe because uh, the guy in the office next to me who did it all knocked on my door and said, the internet's working. And I said, oh, I'll just do an FTP. Oh, yeah, it's working. Great, thanks. And that was it. It wasn't a historical moment, but, uh, uh, well, it is, it is now seen as a historical moment, but it didn't feel like one at the time. Um, in the 80s, I built what you would now say was a, as a browser. It didn't use HTML, but it did, used a lot of the things that we now know in browsers, uh, extensible markup, star sheet languages, uh, uh, client-side scripting, all that stuff. So that when the web came along in the 90s, uh, we as a research group knew what it was all about. And so at the first web conference in uh, 1994, um, I organized the workshops. And it was about as big as this, this conference, about 300 people. Um, and I organized a couple of workshops there. Uh, and, uh, and that's how actually I got involved with, uh, with the web, because Tim Berners-Lee was there. And, uh, uh, and he said, oh, we'd like you to get involved with, uh, with, uh, with the W3C. And as a result, I'm a co-designer of CSS and HTML. Uh, uh, ODF, the uh, open document format, and a number of others uh, as well. Uh, just being in the right place at the r right time. But uh, it was nice that Boris mentioned his first web conference, uh, which was also this size, because I was one of the speakers at that, at that conference. So anyway, um, here's, here's a nice photograph. It's a typical project meeting. In the middle there, that's uh, Guido von Rossum, the person who designed Python. Uh, and that's, uh, that's me on the, uh, on the in the yellow, uh, it was at a party. They say it was a very good party. I don't remember very much of it, I have to tell you. Um, and, uh, and this is me with Tim, Tim Berners-Lee discussing HTML in a, in a very cold, snowy Boston. Anyway, to the point of the talk. So what I want to do is draw, conclusion, draw parallels between the development of, uh, of the book and, uh, and the development of the web and, 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 and talk about what, what parallels we might draw out for the future of, of the web as a result. So this is a print that I have on my wall at home and it's very dear to me for a number of reasons. Firstly, because uh, it was given to me by an aunt of mine. Uh, when she died, she left it to me in her, her will. The second reason I really like it is because it's a picture of my hometown. Uh, and in fact, I used to live just, just down here, and I used to uh, uh, look at that view every day. In fact, that's, that's how the, the same view looks now. But the, the print is uh, from 1790. And another nice thing about it is, in small letters at the bottom, it says, copied by E. Grosser, from an ancient drawing said to be made by Levens. Now, Levens was not actually a disciple of Rembrandt. He was a friend of Rembrandt. Um, he was a child prodigy, and he got called over to England to do, uh, to do portraits of, uh, of, uh, of royalty. Um, uh, uh, so it's said, from an ancient drawing said to be made by Levens, uh, that this was made in 1790. So, I knew a bit about Levens. I mean, he lived in Amsterdam and later in Harlem. Um, and it was true that he was in England in the 1630s. So could this be true? And so uh, thanks to the semantic web and uh, Europeana, I could actually answer that question and find the original uh, drawing, which I, which I really liked. So here, if I, uh, if I improve the, uh, the, the drawing, because this is what the original looks like, and so sort of applying some, uh, some uh, Photoshop to it. Uh, whoop, I'm sorry about that. Apply some Photoshop to it. Uh, it looks, looks a bit better. But the last reason that I really like this print, which we will now go back to, is this this building sticking up over here on the right-hand side, because that's my school. That's the school I went to. And so Levens was in England in 1630. When he made this drawing, uh, my school was already 500 years old, because it was founded in 948. 
Now, uh, that means that it's now more than a thousand years old, and, but even so, it's still only something like the, the, the fifth oldest school in England. So anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's a reason why, I, uh, those, those are the reasons why I like this print. But if we look at that, that building, the school building, this is where the third printing press in England got set up uh, in 1479. Uh, and, uh, and here is uh, one page from one of the books in 1485 that was printed there, uh, the Chronicles of England. Now, it's interesting to look at this because it looks like a manuscript. It looks like it's been made by hand. And the reason is because books were replacing something that already existed. It was replacing manuscripts, and there was a market for manuscripts. And so the people who started producing books didn't think, oh, let's make them more readable. They said, no, we've got to copy manuscripts because that's what people want. Uh, which, which, which is interesting. It took about 50 years before uh, people in Italy started saying, well, actually, we don't need to copy manuscripts. We can actually make it more readable. We can, uh, we can use a better, better, better typeface. So until the introduction uh, of the book, uh, of printing, books were really, really rare. And partly, because, well, mostly because they were really, really expensive. To make a book, a book cost approximately the same price as a small farm would cost. So that means that only extremely rich people had books uh, and rich, rich institutions. The first universities were set up uh, before printing, and so uh, if you as a student wanted to read a book, you had to borrow it, of course, and the price of borrowing it was copying it. So the, the, the book lenders would say, okay, you can borrow it, uh, but you've got to copy it for me, uh, and you've got two weeks to do it in. And, uh, and to sort of speed up this process as well, they'd only give you a little bit of the book at a time. So they'd give you the first bit, you could read it, you copy it out, take it back, and then you could get the next bit. So that was, uh, that was a way of reproducing books in those days. But the other main way, of course, was the monasteries uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, this was where most of the books were produced, uh, which, was, uh, which was nice for the people in power because, of course, it meant they could control very carefully what, what was being produced. But uh, this is a, a quote from Wikipedia just to show you how difficult it was to produce a book. When the Anglo-Saxon monk Wearmouth Jarrow Abbey planned to create three copies of the Bible in 692, uh, of which one survives, the first step necessary was planning to breed the cattle to supply the 1,600 calves necessary uh, for the vellum required, because of books were all written on, on leather, on, on uh, very supple uh, vellum uh, from young calves. It, they weren't written on paper. So that means that the first thing they had to do was get the land in order to have the cows, in order to breed the calves, in order to get the vellum to write the book, and that's before they'd even started writing the book. And then the writing is also, it was also a terrible pain. Uh, it was a slow, expensive, time-consuming, and the monks actually hated it. And in fact, on lots of manuscripts, you find these little side remarks from the poor people writing it out. Oh, my hand, thank God it will soon be dark. Writing is excessive drudgery. It crooks your back, it dims your sights, it twists your stomach and your sides. And the last one I like particularly. Now I've written the whole thing. For Christ's sake, give me a drink. So, when the book came along in, in, in 1450, um, it's, uh, it's, it, took, uh, it took a lot of the, the work away, because firstly they used paper, so you didn't have to do all that, uh, that, that breeding of cattle, um, and of course you could produce lots of books at the same time. What Gutenberg did when he produced his first uh, printing press uh, was just bring together a lot of technologies that actually already existed. I mean, they already knew how to make ink, and that's why the books have survived so very well. He didn't have to, he didn't have to design, work out what, the ink, what ink was and how to make an ink that lasted a long time. That already existed. So lots of the stuff was already there, and he, could, he just brought it all together and put it together in a, in a smart way. So 1450 was the, was the, uh, the first big book, uh, 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 by Gutenberg, and it's interesting to see the growth over the first 50 years, and that's considered the, 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 the real beginning of the book. It's interesting to see the growth of the book uh, in Europe uh, in the first 50 years. So there's, in 1450, the first printing press. Uh, uh, 10 years later, 1470, 1480, 1490, and 1500. 
so you can see it's a, an explosive growth of uh, of, uh, of of books, uh, book printing uh, presses uh, over Europe, uh, and uh, it's surprising that England has only got three uh, by by 1500. But you have to remember there was a civil war there at that time, so it's maybe not so surprising that they were more busy fighting than uh, than than uh, producing books. So by 1500. There were a thousand printing shops in, in Europe. It had really exploded in those 50 years. And I mean, if you think 50 years, well, that's for now, that's just after when the Beatles started. So, you know, it's not that long, really. There are a thousand printing shops in Europe which had produced 35,000 books uh, and 20 million copies. So it was clearly something new really happening. All of a sudden, books were much more available. They weren't cheap. But they were much cheap than they had, cheaper than they had been. The first Bible cost 300 florins, uh, which was about three years' wages for a clerk. Still a lot of money, but all of a sudden much more affordable for the middle class, for instance. So books became a new manner of distributing information. Up to that point, you had so few books, the only way to distribute uh, uh, information was... was, was mouth to ear, basically. So became, books became a new manner of distribution of information, and it was a paradigm shift for the whole, for the whole society, because new industries came up, uh, bookshops, newspapers, binders, a, a whole new infrastructure around, uh, around this new technology uh, burst out. And a lot of people ascribe the Enlightenment where we go from the dark ages of not much information into the rational era that we now live in, uh, due to the availability of books, because people could start writing down the stuff they knew, getting it printed, and spreading it around to other people in Europe. So, by 1665, there were so many scientific books that the first two scientific journals uh, uh, emerged. One in uh, France, the Jean Journal de Scravence, and the one in, in Britain was the Philosophical Transactions. And it's interesting, these scientific journals were created um, uh, in a different form to, uh, to how we now have scientific journals. They were actually there to try and summarize all this information, this information overflow that uh, people were experiencing in books. So basically, they were summarizing what people knew, and so that if you were interested in a particular subject, which book you should uh, you should read? So it was a sort of like an, an it, they were like indexes of uh, of, uh, of information that you could get elsewhere. But the interesting thing is that from that point onwards, right into the 20th century, the number of scientific journals doubled every 15 years. Every 15 years, there were twice as many. And I'm going to talk about doubling in a little bit, in a little bit. But uh, uh, but that is actually a huge a huge growth. And the funny thing is that even as late as the 1970s, if you'd said, oh, when there's not going to be enough paper to produce all those scientific journals shortly, we need a new manner of distributing information, everybody would have caught you, thought you crazy. And that the, the more likely response was, this growth cannot go on anymore because we don't have enough trees to be able to print all, these, all this information in, in, in journals and books. But in fact, the web, or no, the internet came along and saved this growth in a way, uh, because now that we've got the internet, it's still growing at an immense rate. Now, there are different studies that say how, uh, how much uh, information is, is doubling at the moment. Um, uh, these these uh, slides will be online uh, by tomorrow, so uh, the, there are links there to the, uh, to the studies if you're interested. I'm not going to tell you where my slides are, because if you can't find them, you're in the wrong job. Um, so, uh, so one report said that uh, every uh, 11 hours the information was doubling, which I, th that came from IBM actually, so, so it's amazing. But um, my guess is that information is doubling about uh, every year. So every year, twice as much information is becoming available uh, compared with the previous year. And, and here's a very nice, um, a very, very nice di uh, a diagram that shows the growth up to 2007 and showing uh, the, the mix of analog, how originally, uh, originally all information was analog and then it began, uh, began uh, in, uh, to become uh, digital and now most of, most of the storage is, uh, is digital. Again, you can get the source of this uh, from the slides. So, now I want to talk about exponential growth because everybody knows about doubling, but my experience is that people don't really feel what, what doubling means. So, first thing that I should say is, is 
There are lots of things actually in the world that do double uh, at regular inf intervals. Um, uh, but, uh, for instance, if you've got a doubling every two years, that's the same as a, a multitude, a, a tenfold increase every six and a bit years. So it doesn't matter whether it's doubling or as long as it's a multiplication by something, you're going to get, get this huge, these huge increases that I'm about to show you. Uh, we call a tenfold increase an order of magnitude change. And I found this great quote, and, uh, and, and when I first gave th this talk long ago, I, I, I said an order, I, I quoted it, I said, an order of magnitude quantitative change causes a qualitative change. So something happens when it gets 10 times bigger, something different. It's not the same thing anymore. Uh, things really change. Now, I forgot to write down who, the, who made this quote, so uh, before this talk I, I googled it to, to, so that I could add, uh, add the, right, uh, uh, the, the right attribution here. It was me. If I google this quote now, only, me, only I come up. So, uh, so I'm sorry whoever originally said this, I can't find out who you are anymore and I've flooded you out. So if we look at exponential growth, so this is doubling. Uh, um, let's say that this is doubling every year. Uh, what you see is a knee, right? And, and everybody says, once you've passed the knee, then as if there's something special about the knee. That is to say that, that things are doubling and not very important, and then you get past the knee, and that's, that's the important moment in, in, an, in, a, in an explosion, in an exp exponential growth. Now, this is for 20 iterations, and you see the knee is about 15. But if I take exactly the same graph, but take it to 40, uh, 40 iterations, you'll see that the knee is now at 30. So if you ever hear somebody say, it's gone past the knee, they don't know what they're talking about. Because there is no knee. There is no knee, it's purely a visual artifact of how we graph these things. So that thing isn't, isn't really there. And so what you should really do is use a log logarithmic scale, where instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 here, you go up in steps of 10. It's multiples of 10, and then you get a straight line. And that's, that shows you that there's no knee because it really is just a, a straight line. So the important uh, exponential growth for us is Moore's law. And in 1965, Gordon Moore predicted that the integrated circuits would double in power. Actually, he, I got this wrong. He, it's, he, that the number of elements on an integrated circuit would double uh, at the same price uh, for at least 10 years, every year. And in 1975, year, so, so 10 years after he made that prediction, he adjusted that and said it's going to happen actually every 18 months. So that's an order of magnitude increase every five years, which uh, is a big change. So this was his uh, original graph, and last year, uh, uh, last April, uh, Moore's Law became 50 years old. Um, uh, uh, so this was his original graph that, 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 he, uh, uh, that he drew. Um, so if, if we look at what that means for, uh, for us in terms of computers, this is the, 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 and I'm sorry that it's not showing up very well on the screen, this is, this is the graph of the power of our computers since 1988 when, uh, when uh, uh, internet was introduced in the Netherlands. Um, a computer now is worth about half a million times, so it's half a million times more powerful, 500,000 500, times more powerful than a computer in 1988. Or in other, way, in other words, Moore's Law is giving us each day 6,500 new computers uh, of the power of 1988, each day addition in power. So in other words, computers are incredibly more powerful than when the internet was first introduced in the Netherlands. Of course, computers don't get exactly twice as powerful exactly every 18 months, but I have been plotting my personal computers uh, since 1988, and pretty much so, you can see there's a wobble around the line, but basically it's, it's absolutely true uh, that, um, uh, that uh, computers, uh, computers have been getting twice as powerful every, every 18 months. In my 1988, my laptop had a power of 800, doesn't matter what, 800 uh, units. This one has a power of more than 25 million, so that's 15 doublings uh, in that period. Uh, 
Now, uh, last year everybody was saying, uh, oh, well, Moore's Law is 50, it's nearly over. But let me tell you that I've heard that so often. In fact, the first time that I heard it, that it was nearly over was in, I think, 1977, from quite a famous person, uh, Grace Hopper. Uh, and uh, since then I've heard it so many times that I don't believe it anymore when people say that. Uh, and, uh, and somebody else apparently doesn't because there was this great tweet uh, last year. The number of press articles speculating the end of Moore's Law doubles every 18 months. And here's a, here's a data point. Last year, the Raspberry Pi 2 came out exactly three years after the Raspberry Pi 1. So that's exactly two Moore's Law cycles. And it was pretty much four times as powerful. It was actually six times faster, had four times as many cores, four times as much memory, twice as many USB ports. It was the same size and the same price. So I still don't believe that Moore's Law is nearly at an end. I may be wrong, but uh, it doesn't matter. And here's a nice example. Look, this is November 2006. I found this in, in a corner of an old raincoat. Uh, it's a, um, a, a four gigabyte uh, uh, USB stick where they said they reduced the price, special offer, they reduced the price from 150 euros to 90 euros. And this was only 10 years ago that, they, uh, that, that, that you would have to pay 90 euros for a four gig uh, USB stick. So it really, it really is happening and it's really amazing. What, I mean, it's a great time to live basically because computers just keep on getting cheaper and faster. But still, people don't really understand what, what exponential growth means. And I heard on a radio broadcast a BBC reporter say, your current PC is more powerful than the computer they had on board the first flight to the moon. And that was right, but very, very wrong. And let me demonstrate why. We take a piece of paper and we divide it in two. And in, in one half, we write this year's date, 2016. Now, the other half, we divide in two again, and we write the date 18 months ago. So in other words, on the left-hand side is a computer, the power of a computer that you would buy now. And on the right-hand side, half as big, is uh, the power of a computer that you would bought for the same price 18 months ago. Now we do the same again, and we divide the remaining space in half, and now that's the power of a computer that, uh, uh, that you would have paid the same price for. It's one quarter the size, uh, one quarter the power of one uh, that you could buy three years later. And then we keep doing that until our pencil runs out or we can't write anymore. And what you see is that your current computer is more powerful than all the other computers you've owned ever in your life put together. So, in other words, your current computer is amazingly, amazingly powerful. And in fact, on a society, a society level, uh, it, that's even more so, since a computer lasts more than eight month, 18 months, it lasts about five years. So, in fact, currently in society, we have about 90% of the power, the total computer power, that we've ever had in our whole existence. So, 1968, the internet was born. Um, it was a cooperative eff effort uh, um, the, of universities linking to each other. And in 1988, 20 years later, it arrived in the offices, office next to mine at CWI, uh, uh, as I said, at a speed of 64 kilobits per second. Um, and a year later, that was doubled to 128 kilobits, and we were so happy, yes, 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 at last speed. But in fact, better than Moore's Law, Uh, uh, network speeds, bandwidth, inc doubles per year at the same price. That's absolutely amazing. And this again, this is my, uh, a graph of my home uh, bandwidth. And again, you can see that it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, a doubling, uh, constant doubling uh, over the years. So for the same, price, same cost, for the same price, you pay, you get twice as much bandwidth per year on average, if you average it out over time. And even in Amsterdam at the CWI, That's the base uh, where AMSIX, the uh, in Internet Exchange, uh, uh, Amsterdam Internet Exchange is. Um, and uh, that's the second biggest internet node in the world. And I looked it up uh, yesterday. They currently manage 4.7 terabits, sorry, not bytes, terabits per second, 4.7 terabits per second, an enormous number. And if you calculate that over the 27 years since the internet started, that is a 95% yearly growth, so very nearly doubling per year uh, since the beginning of the internet in, in the Netherlands. 
Now, the nice thing about the internet was it had a big effect on the cost of communication. And what it did was that it showed us the true cost of communication. Because up to that moment, if you wanted to phone America, it was more expensive than if you wanted to phone your, your neighbor next door. And in fact, it was basically the further you phoned, the more expensive it got. What we poor phone people phoning, using the phones didn't know was that that was not based on reality in any sense of the word. That the cost, the true cost of communications by a telephone, the expensive bit was the line going from you to your exchange because you were the only one using that. But once it got to the exchange, all the other lines were being shared by thousands of people simultaneously. And so the actual cost of using that was minute. So that when the internet came along, that first day that he, he knocked on my door and said, the internet's up, and I tried FTP, I FTP'd to uh, a site in New York. And it didn't cost me anything more to go to New York than it did to go to the computer across the corridor. Because the costs, the, co the long distance costs are, not, are being amortized, shared over thousands of users at the same time. The internet made this clear and that's why phoning, for instance, has now become so, so cheap, because now we could just use the internet for phoning, uh, and the phone companies can't try and fool us and say, oh, well, you're phoning further, you've got to pay more. So now it's just as expensive for you to phone New York as it is to phone your next door neighbor. So 1990s, two years after the, web, uh, the internet came to, uh, to uh, Europe, uh, along came the web, Tim Berners-Lee at CERN in, uh, in Switzerland, France, Switzerland. And just like Gutenberg, in a way, he brought, well, I should say they, because it was two of them, Robert Caillou doesn't get so much press, but the two of them uh, built the web. Uh, they, they brought together lots of existing technologies. Hypertext wasn't new. The internet wasn't new. Mime types, they weren't new. But what they did was they created a co cohesive whole. They weren't the only ones trying to do something simpler. They were just similar. They were just the ones that won. And one of the reasons that they won was because they did it for free. They gave it away for free. Since then, of course, we've had an explosion, just like an explosion of all those printing presses. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that now there are just millions, of course, uh, of websites uh, across the whole world. And basically, the web is now replacing a lot of information sources that we used to have in the book. The web is replacing the book in, in, in many ways, along with lots of other things. Telephone directories, who looks at those anymore? Uh, encyclopedias, again, they've all, they've all gone out of business. Train table, timetables, those were used to be books. Other references works, they were the first to go. Uh, but most, most, uh, most others will follow. Books as an artifact, as a thing that you can actually hold, will mostly disappear. Uh, they'll become a niche mark, market, and all information will become web-based. And that is the reason why it's important for us to plan for the future and not just think about the next great thing that we can put on a website. And that's really the message of, of, of my talk. I might keep the time. Oh, I'm good. doing all right. So the funny thing about new technologies is that people never see them as they will be in the future. They just adapt them to the current situation. So, for instance, steam engines, when they were first introduced in factories, there was just one of them in the, in the factory, and then lots of pulleys going to all the machines to drive it. And so, with the in, in invention of the electric motor, everybody thought that was exactly what the same thing was going to happen, that you would have one electric motor in the basement of your house, and then lots of pillar, uh, pulleys going around the house to drive the kitchen things and, and whatever. And they really thought that there would be one vacuum cleaner engine uh, in, the in the bottom of your house, and in each room there'd be these, these outlets where you could uh, plug, plug, a, a, plug a, a suction thing on to, uh, to, to, to suck up the dirt. Um, and the same with computers, actually, when they first came along. With mainframe computers, there's the famous quote that, uh, that they thought that five computers should more or less cover the computing needs of the whole world. They couldn't imagine that anybody would want a personal computer because nobody needed to do payrolls. So when new technologies come along, uh, they often imitate the old technology in a, in, in, in a very direct manner. I mean, the very first cars, they really do look like horseless carriages. Uh, 
so yeah, well, the first books, as you saw, the first books looked like ma manuscripts. They imitated the old technology. The first cars looked like carriages. And in fact, uh, when radio first came along, the actors still had to dress up in their, in their, in their costumes when they were performing a, a play um, because uh, they just hadn't got their heads around the fact that, well, if they can't see you, you don't need to dress up. And in lots of ways, the web is still imitating old media. It's slowly getting better, but it's not yet better. What we need to do is think about 100 years in the future. And the reason we need to do that is because now that the books are disappearing, slowly, slowly but surely, and all the information is now on the web, we don't want to lose that information. Because if that information goes away, then we're losing our history, we're losing, uh, we're losing a lot of in interesting information. It's got to remain visible and readable for at least 100 years. Uh, it's, you know, five years is, is, is not enough. So we've got to design our web for the next 100 years, not for the next five years. At the moment, some of the problems are that content is presentation-oriented. It's, it's, it's very much about the visual. There's very little device independence. We're using all these devices, but lots of people still have to plan different uh, sites or different versions of their content for different sorts of devices. But there are so many, hu so hugely many different formats of uh, devices that, uh, that that's very hard to do. There's very little accessibility. By accessibility, I mean the ability to read this stuff if you're blind or you've got very poor sight. And yeah, all of you are young and you can read websites now, fine. But when you're 80, the web will be your only source of information and you will have trouble reading your websites, the websites available. You have to get into your heads now that the websites have to be accessible because the web is the only source of information for people. It's the only way to access government uh, services, local government services. And so it's absolutely important that everybody be able to see it and not just 30-year-olds 30 year with, uh, with great eyesight. And I would say authoring is too hard, especially with the coming of HTML5. Uh, um, uh, uh, you need programming skills to create current websites, uh, which, which it puts the production of web content into the hands of a small group rather than the whole uh, the whole community. So, um, so we need a web that's primarily content oriented. That is to say the content is really the king. And I'm not opposed to presentation, but the content has got to be there that you can, you can find it uh, uh, and, and present it in a different, different way uh, uh, if necessary. The content and the website has got to be designed so that it's accessible for multi-devices. It's too much effort to seriously design websites for every new format that comes along. Uh, uh, there needs to be a generic way of uh, repurposing the content, uh, content to different devices. So I've said accessibility. Even when we're 80, we'll still want to use the websites. We need to make our 30-year-old selves sensitive to the problems of our less abled future selves. Uh, we, need, uh, we need better authorability. Well, things like Drupal help, but remember that, that, uh, that we need content that's going to exist for 100 years, and so we shouldn't have to depend on the existence of particular sets of software uh, to, to make it available in the future. And this is one of the problems of JavaScript, that it's not an, an example of future thinking to say, in 100 years' time, we're going to have to have exactly the same JavaScript interpreter that we have now in order to be able to look at the content that we produce today. Availability, well, I could go on for hours about this. HTTP is a good protocol. It's lasted well for the last 25 years. It's beginning to show its age, and we really need to think about new ways of, uh, of, of, of distributing the content. Uh, uh, part of the reason, part of the problem is that it's a single point of failure, which makes it easier, for instance, for governments to censor. Um, but it also means that uh, if, uh, if a site suddenly becomes popular, nobody can see it anymore because it gets over overflowed. And, uh, and that's partly a problem of the design of HTTP. So what is to c come? Well, interlinking of services. Um, uh, 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 and we're already see seeing this now. Data doesn't need to be just human readable. It has to be machine readable as well so that the services can talk to each other and so they can use, uh, use the content. So uh, for, 
for instance, a conference website like this one has date, time, and location, but you can't read that with a machine and be sure that you've got the date, the right date, the right time, and the right location. In fact, if, you go to, if, a, if a search engine just goes to a website, it doesn't even know that it's necessarily about an event. This needs to change. It needs to be obvious to a search engine, for instance, that this is a, an event at a place at a certain time. Because then you can get so much more value out of that website. A search engine can, uh, can do stuff with it, but also your browser can do stuff with it. If your browser, uh, you, you open up this uh, website, your browser says, oh, this is an event. Would you like me to add it to your agenda? Would you like to see a map of where it is? Oh, I see it's not in this country. Shall I look up flights for those dates? Shall I look up uh, hotels in that location? That would all be possible if our websites were machine-readable as well as human-readable. And that's got to happen in the future. Of course, internet's coming everywhere now. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to drive lights. It's going to drive your oven, your alarm clock. Uh, there's no reason why internet shouldn't just be over the electric in, uh, net so that, so that you don't even have to have an extra, an extra connection. All communication is going to go, going to be via IP. Uh, that's more or less true now, but it's, uh, it's, it's going to get even better. But an important thing is that nothing need ever become available again. No books ever need to go out of print, and everybody can become a publisher. An advantage of this is that small language groups, like in Fri Fri uh, the Frisians, for instance, uh, they can now publish their books and everybody can read them and they don't have to have a huge infrastructure in order to get their books uh, uh, to, the, to the readers. And the last thing that I think is interesting is that the internet showed us the true cost of communication. And I think that the battles that we're now seeing, like, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the battles over copyrights at, at W3C, those battles are because we will see the true cost of content as well. That, in fact, just as we were being ripped off on our phone calls, because it didn't really cost that much to phone New York, we're being ripped off over the cost of content because it doesn't really cost that much to produce, uh, to produce those things. And, in fact, as a, I say this as a book author myself, I wrote a book once, I got 10%, of course, of the sales of those books, but the, the publishers got 90% of that money. Now that we don't need that infrastructure to publish books because I can just now put a book online and anybody can read it, and in fact that book originally got read by maybe a, a thousand people, but once it went out of print, I got it back, I put it online, and now it's been read by 100,000 people, so I'm happy. I don't, I don't want that money, actually. I want people to read it. So what will happen is that once the infrastructure for books is no longer necessary and everything can be done by, by the web, that means the costs plummet just as they plummeted with, uh, uh, with phone calls. And uh, what we will see is what the true cost of content is, and we won't be ripped off as we are now being ripped off by publishers and, and music publishers. So the big question, though, is with this extra availability of information, Will we get some sort of second enlightenment? Up until now, inf all information, I mean, in the beginning, when, when manuscripts were handwritten, all information was controlled by, basically by the church. And so you only got stuff that the church were willing to let you read. When the book came along, the church had lots of troubles with that. And in fact, that's when they introduced uh, 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 a lot of censorship um, because they didn't like the stuff that they were seeing. That's calmed down somewhat now, but still, it's conglomerates that control what we get to read and what we get to see and what we get to hear. Um, but it doesn't need to be like that anymore. Anybody can publish and anybody can get, uh, can get information. So the interesting thing is, now that the conglomerates don't control all the information, will that change how society works and how society thinks? It's a change in the means of distribution. It's a change in the availability of information. It's a real paradigm shift. So my conclusion, which is a good time for it, we are at a turning point in history. 
we're abs absolutely, so, so much is changing uh, because it's happening year to year and we're not so, so aware of it, but if you step back just and look over uh, a decade or two, uh, things are changing immensely. So we're really at a turning point in history. Uh, something to tell your grandchildren about. Uh, the internet is going to have a great, as great effect on society as the book, only very, very much quicker. It's not going to take 50 years. We're already at that period. The means of distribution are changing hands. I love this quote from, uh, from Marshall McLuhan, who in 1964 said, the classified ads and stock market quotations are the bedrock of the press. I, never knew, I don't know of anybody other than him who thought that. Should an alternate, alternative form of easy access to such diverse daily information be found, the press will fold. And this was before the internet. So it was, uh, it was ama amazing foresight that, uh, that he saw that the press uh, was based, actually, its income was based on the fact that people bought the newspaper not for the news, but actually for other stuff, and that once that other stuff was available, then they would go elsewhere. And this other, uh, this other quote from the Institute of the Future, we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Thank you. Or a, a nice talk with all the context, uh, historical context. Maybe some people have have a question for Stephen. Hi, I was wondering about archiving. About what? Sorry, archiving. Ar archiving, yes, and preservation, because not all information, of course, is is worthy of of uh, archiving, uh, but all the doubling and so on going on. So what's your opinion about that? So not all the information is worthy of archiving. And you're absolutely right. And in fact, I've just written an article about this. The problem is you don't know what is worthy until the future. And the, the reason I say this is because my library at work has had recently had on display a letter, a handwritten letter from Albert Einstein that they found in their, uh, somewhere in their, in their archive. And when he wrote that, he wasn't famous. He was just some res maths researcher, um, where I work as a maths research institute. But now, of course, that's immensely interesting. And the problem is that people in the past, too, have very easily just chucked stuff away and said, oh, well, nobody's going to be interested in that. But you never can tell. I have to admit that I had an Apple Lisa at my work once. We used it for a project. We programmed on it. And at the end of the project, it's a big computer, and it got in the way, and we didn't need it anymore, and it was getting slower and slower compared with the other things we had. In the end, we just chucked it. We just threw it out. We didn't want it. But an Apple Lisa is now immensely valuable, and, uh, and uh, it was a real blunder on my behalf to say, oh, well, we'll just chuck it. Uh, and the problem is we, you can't know what's valuable until you get to the point when it's going to be valuable. So it is a problem. On the other hand, disk costs are plummeting, uh, just, uh, just as, uh, as the power of computers are uh, exponential. The cost of a, of a bit of disk is also exponentially halving all the time. So my advice is, A, don't throw stuff away. B, um, try and keep stuff on the web as well, because uh, People link to it, and in 10 years' time, it might be really, really interesting. Uh, for instance, this website uh, for this conference might, it would be interesting because to know who spoke here and what they were talking about. That, this, that might be the only source of that information. So I think archiving is really important, uh, and uh, we shouldn't take it lightly. Any more questions? Um, thank you for your speech. Uh, your future vision of um, fast information flow and web-based information flows is very dependent on, simply said, electricity. Yeah. And what if the, our power grid goes down for a longer time? Um, we have to plan, but do we, uh, aren't we uh, um, at the same time very vulnerable? Uh, well, uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, there's no doubt that that, that it's all dependent on on the electricity supply. I don't uh, admit to any expertise in uh, the production of electricity, uh, uh, nor can I give any advice. But of course, backup power supplies are 
are very important. I mean, of course, it all depends on society uh, uh, surviving uh, global warming. Uh, so, uh, you know, something needs to be done that, about that as well. But you're right, but um, I can't offer any advice, I'm afraid. One last question? No? Okay. okay. Thank so, you very much. Thank you again very much, Stephen.